Miss Tiffany Wong. Give Benita a round of applause for a live taping today. I appreciate you. So again, please stay very attentive. We're gonna have a great show. You know, relationships are overrated. You know, I run into all types of individuals, old men, young men, whew, but they men. Oh, they always talk about, oh, you real sexy. I say, thank you, I know. But then when I start looking at myself, I realize I'm like, oh, baby girl, thick in the hips. Dang, then I turn to the side, I'm like, boy, I am somebody. But then when I turn all the way around, look like I'm a linebacker for the Rams. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. I consider this to be multi-purpose. I do things that the little girls can't do, like uh, pick up couches. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, y'all laughing. Y'all laughing, but think about it. When you and your partner got to go, she, your girlfriend, and bought a new couch. I ain't here. My man ain't got to go get his partner. Come on, I tell him, get your in, brother. Come on, get your in. <laughs> Men, you all have the worst pickup lines. Like, guy saw me. He say, mm, mm, mm. You are so sexy. Again, I say, <laughs> bam, bam, boom. <laughs> he say, but uh, your legs go all the way up to heaven and I'm ready to meet the Lord. <laughs> I say that would, won't be a pickup line that you or I will do anything else together. <laughs> Again, men, it's just some things that you all shouldn't do. Like, when you ask a lady out on a date, both of y'all should look at the bill to see who gonna pay for it. Have you ladies, have you ever went out with a man and you looked at the bill, he looked at the bill? The bill kept sitting there. You look at the bill, he looked at the bill. Bill kept sitting there. And then he say, uh, when we gonna go out again? And you say, until you pay for that bill, I really don't know. <laughs> Life is too short, you all. Some things, again, are overrated, like sex. I know, ooh, that's the bad word. Ooh, 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 she said sex. Throw the holy water on her. Throw the holy water. This lady said, yeah, throw the holy water on her. She said the word sex. Sex, S-E-X. Sex. Look at her, she like, I like sex. I like sex. Look at her, she raising her hand. I like sex. <laughs> she said, I can spell it, S-E-X. <laughs> Sex is overrated. Look at it, she's like, mm, mm. But sex is overrated. You know, when you were little, your mama used to tell you not to do it. But then you turn around and you do it. Then you can't live without it. It's just like money. Just like money. Money and sex go together sometimes, don't they? Look at him, he like, yeah, I didn't spend it on something before. I didn't spend it on something before. Just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit of sex. Again, my name is comedian Miss Tiffany, you all. I'll be back up to entertain you all again. Give Benita a round of applause for a live taping today. Appreciate y'all. Thank you all so much again for coming out here to the Bonita Show and supporting our independent artists and the independent TV show, bringing education and love, light, and laughter to the world. That's what we do. And the first person we have up is Miss Barbara Altman. So, Barbara, tell us about you. Um, I, I'm a St. Louis native. Well, I've lived in Webster Groves for all of my life, except for six weeks in Kansas. And, and that's, that's, in the, that's in the book. In a little tiny town called Lardin, Lardin, Kansas. And my story is about recovering from depression, anxiety, and psychosis. You wrote about hallucinations. She experienced hallucinations as a child. And um, I want to ask you, do you still experience those hallucinations? And can you tell us about like the first time it happened to you? Yes, I remember it as though it happened five minutes ago. And of course, it was a little longer than five minutes ago. I was six years old, and um, I was um, a beautiful summer day. And I was outside playing, and um, the milkman came. So I got very excited, because you know the milkman meant that I got to eat some ice cream. So I went into the kitchen, asked my mother for a nickel. That was when ice cream was a nickel. Uh, and she gave me the nickel, and I came back outside and um, got the ice cream from the milkman. And there on the sidewalk, I saw something absolutely horrific. And I won't go into the details, because it's, it's in the book. Uh, <laughs> that's that part of it. I, I can smile now, but then it really wasn't 
a smiling matter. It was also the first time that um, I had the experience of not being believed, because when I went back in to tell my mother, she kind of brushed it off. So it, it was a lonely experience, and that kind of carried through my life when other experiences happened. Are the hallucinations still a part of your life today? No, they're not. Um, I think that's largely because of my heavy involvement in music. Uh, when I went to college uh, at Fampan University, the hallucination stopped when I was about nine. Well, in the book I say 19. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I was actually 18, uh, my first year in college. And I think that's because I had deep immersion in what I loved to do. And I had the constant hearing of opera, <laughs> Um, listening to piano music, listening to choral music, I think that's what that's where the initial healing came. So music, music helped you to heal. Wow. Um, how did the um, these manifestations? How did they affect your work life? I had a huge challenge with um, concentration, and. At, at the time that I started, had my first job at Washington University in 1968, um, I wasn't able to, to finish the, um, my job requirements because of the concentration issues. I didn't have the hallucinations anymore, but the lack of focus, brain fog. I thought I made that term up. I didn't. In your book, you talk about how it takes a village to help the mentally ill. Um, what do you mean when you say it takes a village? No man is an island. That village for me has been my church. That village has been mental health counselors. Blessings to all mental health counselors. That village has been doctors, both medical doctors and alternative doctors. That village has been friends. That village has been all my piano and guitar students. And if I say any more, I'm going to cry. Any recommendations you have for um people who may be experiencing um, some of the things that you write about in your book, or if we have relatives that go through some of the things that you talk about, any recommendations at all? My first recommendation is learn to reframe negative events. Think of something maybe even funny or humorous that happened right around that time, or reframe it to a purpose. I call it pain, well, pain to purpose or pain to positive. And when you get that purpose going, as in helping people to overcome addictions and things like that, then it, it just puts a different color on it. The second is observe and emulate. Um, I had um, schizoaffective, hmm, how would I put it, uh, flat affect. So I learned, my therapist said, observe and emulate healthy behaviors. And I kind of scripted that on my mind. It's amazing how quickly the positive things that we do can very quickly change the negative. Um, and then the third one is pray. Just be in constant contact with God and always tap into that community, that village. Can you, any, any, what, can you think of one embarrassing moment that you had to deal with? with um, your illness, one embarrassing moment that you could share this, this maybe it could be comical? Well, I'm not sure that this is connected with my illness, but it was connected with, uh, should I connect it with the illness? Uh, well, it was connected with my 13-year-old um, high school wanting to uh, disobey the rules. I, I went to a Catholic high school. So, uh, and I, I include this in the book too. Uh, they told us never to go into the cloister. So that was an open invitation for me to go into the cloister. <laughs> and I walked upstairs and into the cloister and this a real scary looking nun looked at me and said, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I got lost. <laughs> and ran back down the stairs. And there are quite a few others too. Um, getting stuck under the piano at a, at a piano concert and things like that. Well, Ms. Altman, thank you for coming on. <laughs> Recovering from depression, anxiety, psycho and psychosis. You have um, handouts that have all of the authors, their information. So check it out if you get a chance. Thank you, Ms. Altman. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Kizzy Johnson, come on up.
the coffee shop therapist, sound advice for life's bills. And she talks, she tells a lot of tales, a lot of stories in there um, that deal with a lot of hard issues. And she gives recommendations on how to get through um, those issues. Kizzy, tell us about you. I am from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I've lived in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, which I absolutely loved and wish I was there right about now. Uh, and I've lived also in Chicago as well. Just kind of a nomad, really, at heart. But I'm back here in St. Louis and just loving every moment of it, tapping into my creativity. Now, tell us about these, the stories that you have in your book. One, pick out one. You talk about. Um, each story begins with someone unsure of how to approach a sensitive topic and ends with you showing them how to face it head on. Um, some of these topics are, are, you talk about taboos, stigmas, and controversial topics. Which one of the topics would you say is your favorite or most controversial that you'd like to speak about? So the one story in the book that people are really gravitating to is called polyamorous what? And <laughs> first people are like, well, what is polyamorous? And then after I explain it, they go, oh yeah, we want to talk about that. Uh, so polyamorous is a, a, a form of a relationship where there are multiple people in the relationship and they know about each other and they agree to have this type of relationship. And so I talk with a young lady who um, is basically in a polyamorous relationship and hasn't really realized that that's what she's in, but she doesn't want to leave her partner and he doesn't want to leave the other woman that he's involved with. So I sit down and I talk to her and we talk about how to talk to him about that and what questions to bring up and what rules to set for the relationship and we kind of get through it. Any ways that we can be more proactive, it's particularly in our, um, in our urban communities where we're hurting each other, um, any, any recommendations in that area, uh, any advice that you have in um, the coffee shop? It's really about knowing how to um, communicate in a healthy way. So as far as being proactive in the community, um, whether it's a neighbor or it's a lover or a friend or in a community setting, just be positive about your approach. Everything should be talked about. Nothing should be bottled up inside and, and kept and made you feel alone. But just being able to be positive, how to acknowledge body language, and that also helps you determine how to enter into a conversation that you have with somebody. Any of you all have any questions for um, about what she's talking about in um, Coffee Shop Therapist, Sound Advice for Life Skills? Anybody have, a, have any questions for, for our guest today? For Ms. Kizzy Johnson? What actually made you write that type of book? I mean, you don't, you normally grow up and certain things that you go through, was it anything that you particularly went through that made you or felt that this was the type of book needed? What, how did you come about writing it? And I wrote Coffee Shop Therapist because I wanted people to know that they're not alone. Communication is very important in order to have a healthy life. And so after uh, 20 years of giving advice to people about what to say about this and how do I tell him about this and I want my girlfriend to know about this but I don't know what she's going to say, I thought I would put it in a book so that um, you can know how to actually begin that conversation, how to open up that dialogue because there are a lot of books that tell us what to do, but not so many that tell us how to. Like, I literally give you an example of a common situation, and then I give you phrases and sentences that you can begin your own conversation with and get to the root of whatever issue you've been suppressing. I just had a question. How did you learn what you've, what you're, the information you're passing along? What kind of research did you do? Um, and how did you know you had this gift to share with other people? I learned from life in watching people. I observe people 100% of the time. I read body language, and I've become a confident as well to people. Say they come to me, and they pour their hearts out to me, and I'm able to then give them advice from the heart, things that I've been told from my mother and my grandmother. And along with that, I am an avid reader. So anything about psychology, because that was my major when I was at Jackson State, even though I didn't obtain a degree, um, anything about psychology, I read. So that, along with my mother's wisdom and my grandmother's wisdom, have helped me be able to give people sound advice for life skills. 
obviously you, you uh, dealt with a topic that people avoid because they are judgmental. And I wanted to find out if in your book you deal with the difference between what people avoid because they are judgmental and those that they avoid because they just hurt. And even though I don't specifically talk about the difference of judgmental versus hurt, you can definitely see that there is a theme of both in the book, especially like with the polyamorous what, that's more of a judgmental. People are afraid to really bring that up because they don't want to be judged by society, by their friends. Um, whereas I talked to a young lady about, um, well, this can be hurt and judgmental, a young lady about how to tell her current lover about her past abuse she abused, she was raped, and how to kind of open up that conversation, that could be heard as well as judgmental as well. So in my book, it's one or the other, really. You kind of narrowed it down. People are afraid to talk about topics because it's either judgmental or they're afraid or, or they're hurt about whatever the situation is. Um, I talked to a young lady about getting over death She's been grieving over death for a very long time, and she hasn't been able to start her own life and her own family. So, like, why should you move on, and how do you move on? So, hurt, again. So those are, I don't specifically talk about this is hurt, this is judgmental, but you can clearly identify them in the book, each chapter. Well, Kizzy, thank you for bringing us coffee shop therapist, sound advice for... Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for bringing me my own signed copy. You guys, you have her information in the handouts. You know, go to her website and, uh, and, and check her out and, um, and buy her books. And um, we're going to keep you up here because we have Dr. Sonoria Brown who's going to be joining us. Come on up, Dr. Sonoria Brown. <laughs> Now, Dr. Sonoria Brown is a retired military veteran like myself, and she is also a, um, she specializes in mental health disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders, and she works a lot with um, military rape victims. And I got a big question about that, but here, I'm gonna let you tell us about you before we get into all these questions. Thank you. And I, first of all, before I get started, I'd like to thank everyone for taking time from your busy days to spend some time with us at the Benita Show. And Benita, thank you very much for having me as one of your guests. Um, as for myself, I am a native East St. Louisan and a proud graduate of East St. Louis Senior High School. I went into the military. I was a flight nurse. I, I'm one of those people who said that when you can't do something, then that's my invitation to do it. <laughs> um, during that time, they said that um, I had two strikes against me, being um, a, a woman of color and daring to go into uh, the area of flight that was preserved for my lighter persuasion brothers uh, in the military. And I said, no, my God didn't say I couldn't do it, so I would make that a, a concern later on. I was successful in getting through flight school in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, during my military career, I was, hurt. I was injured really bad. And they said I would never walk again, but duh, God saw different, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, left. The, retired from the military, went to Wash U, got my MSW in social work because nurses are taught social work, social workers are not taught nursing. And I put those together, they became a great marriage. And because I have such a thirst for education because of the type of parents that I had, I continued on in school, became a board certified psychotherapist and later uh, got my doctorate. And I was in private practice for a while until my husband uh, passed away from cancer and I had my my grandson that I was raising, who's in the back, Lloyd. Hi, Lloyd. <laughs> I continued to raise him, and I had to close my practice. Uh, at that time, I was uh, working with the state of Illinois on death penalty cases. I also have my certification in forensics, and um, I did forensics for the state of Illinois. When I closed my practice, I decided to work with other veterans, and the area that was the most in need was working with PTSD and women with military sexual trauma. My first and biggest question is, how, please tell me, how does rape happen in our military? And you know, I'm a 22-year veteran myself. Um, I may have seen one or two 
ladies that have, um, it may have happened to in the Air Force, and then, you know, I'm not privy to those, was not privy to those particular documents. I know I had to deal with the repercussions, with the after effects of them having to come to work, taking all these different types of medications and being off from work because they can't get to work because of the medication. So um, do I know exactly what happened? I do not. But how does that happen? Rape in the military is not a new phenomenon. It has been going on for as long as men have been living with men in the military. It's like in the prison system. Rape has been in the prison system for as long as men have been chained and locked up together. But we in our Western society, it's an unpleasant subject. And because of that, uh, the military does not want to, even today, accept the fact that women are being raped. We are not just being touched. It's not unwanted touches and, 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 and advances, verbal advances. Women are actually uh, in combat now, and the rape has been underreported. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, we as a nation still do not want to believe it nor hear it. Um, it's underreported because we in the military are afraid that it's going to hurt our military career because the political arms go far and why. The person who raped you may be related to or friends to someone in Washington or someone who has connections to Washington. And when you tell you've just ruined your military career, you have, may also have ruined your future employment opportunities as well. So you keep it to yourself. How are we helping um, the ladies who do come forward and, and, and share their experiences with you? How do you help them? How, what are some resources? What are some good advice? What are some counseling that you use um, to help them? When the ladies come as fractured as they come, the first thing I do is tell them that it wasn't their fault. It wasn't and it never will be their fault. And to try to provide them a safe place, a safe room, in order to talk to me in any manner that they wish. Some of the ladies can be very colorful in their language, and that's okay. If that helps you say what you need to say, it's okay. And in doing that, helping them to get their power back. Uh, during the last uh, political season, we had some controversy about uh, how women's bodies function when they were raped and, and even about how the, the rape may be legitimate or not. Uh, can you comment on, uh, on, on how prevalent that mindset is and what is actually behind the need uh, to distinguish between the various types of rape as uh, our local politician here got into trouble trying to distinguish? The rape means whether it's the prostitute who wasn't paid by her John, or someone who drank too much, had a Mickey placed in their drink. Rape is rape. It's unwanted advances. And there is no legitimacy to it. No is no. Rape is rape. It's forceful entry. Um, as a result of rape and um, it resulting in pregnancy, how is that handled? That has come up a few times um, in our VA system, and there's a wonderful woman named Sandra Brown, who is a social worker with the VA Medical Center at Jefferson Barracks. She and some other very caring female veterans came together and provided um, a baby showers. They're trying to help her turn a negative into a positive for those ladies who choose to keep the baby. Any, um, any recommendations you can give to us and, and to the communities, how we can help people who find themselves in these particular situations? Yes, the first thing we have to do is to help each other understand and accept that it's okay to say that I'm afraid, that I don't understand, that I'm depressed, and that it's okay to embrace our men who need to cry. I can't emphasize that enough. Our men are walking around like the walking wounded because our society says men do not cry. If they cry, they make them a wuss. They exchange their, their boxer shorts for panties, you know, that kind of thing. And that's not true. 
despite all that we go through in life, know that we're all made perfectly imperfect on purpose by God. So we'll always need him whether we want to or not. This concludes the first portion of our of our show today. We're gonna have a um, we're gonna have an intermission. We're gonna have the band play us a tune. Yeah. We're gonna have our comedian come back up for a little bit, and then we're gonna take a break and we have refreshments. So enjoy the band. Are you are you ready? My whole world's lost and lonely Cause you just up and left me I never will forget And I still hold that pain oh, You were gone when I was so young I had to learn it all on my own Even though I've lived and I'm grown I'll never be the same I'm buried inside Just wanna hide It's all cause you left me I'm buried inside, too dark to find It's time to make everything right and save my own life Save my own life And even when I'm down and struggling I'll never do the same thing I'll never be like you Or make the same mistakes and this is my time to shine now I won't let you drag me down Gonna rise up off the ground And do whatever it takes I'm buried inside Just wanna hide It's all cause you left me to die I'm buried inside Too dark to find It's time to make everything right And see my own life I I just want to hide It's all cause you left me to die I'm buried inside Too dark to find It's time to make everything right And say bye Let's see. 